Welcome to This Academic Life, Episode 40. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I am a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, my name is Pani Anuel. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I am a professor of mechanical engineering. I recently went to a talk that is delivered by Dr. Daniel Larimore, who is the most recent recipient of the Waterman Lecture. He talked about the U.S. faculty hiring and retention. It was a very informative and very comprehensive data analysis on U.S. faculty hiring in the last 10 years. After the talk, I dug out the most recent Nature publication that he mentioned during the talk. This title of the paper is Quantifying Hierarchy and Dynamics in U.S. Faculty Hiring and Retention. This paper is co-authored by him and his students. He is the contacting author. He's coming from the Department of Computer Science at University of Colorado Boulder. I read the paper. There are a few things I thought that came out really interesting, which we can then discuss a little bit further. The analysis that he posed are based on tenured and tenure track faculty employed in the last 10 years from 2011 to 2020 from 368 PhD granting universities in the U.S. For all of these universities, they would grant doctoral degrees. They would track all the faculty by their rank, by their gender, by the year of their doctoral degree that was granted to them. In order to be included in all their analysis, a professor must be a member of their tenure and tenure track faculty in a department. They would sample a total of close to 300,000 faculty in a little bit more than 10,000 departments. So the reason I am stating all of those numbers is to say that at least from what I have read in the recent years, there hasn't been such a comprehensive collection of data. This paper is a thorough analysis of all the data he collected through the last 10 years. And the theme from this paper is really to talk about prestige and how that is playing a central role in structuring the U.S. faculty hiring as well as retention in the overall U.S. universities. First, I would like to get your impression on how prestige had played a role in the field of research or your department that you were in. First of all, Lucy, I was really impressed by those numbers and I should say, go buffs. So this guy, I don't know how he collected this many data and did this analysis, but to answer your question, I've seen it in our field. Since Lucy, you and I, we are in similar field. I've seen that the prestigious institute, they play a significant role in our society and the people that they end up becoming a faculty in these areas. At a school that I'm in, we have searches. We try not to be putting a lot of heavy weight on the schools that the candidates are coming from. But I think overall, we are all biased. And at the end, we might end up having people coming from prestigious schools or institute, even though we try not to. But at the end of the day, the outcome is kind of shifted towards those schools. I agree. I think we probably should have some type of unconscious bias training when it comes to reviewing applications and selecting applicants for jobs. And I mean it from a perspective of the prestige aspect. It's very difficult to not check the application for the school they come from. It's a little bit easier not to check the gender or the race. 
<laughs> but it's a little bit more difficult to not think about where they received their PhD or even what year they received their PhD. And then the next intuitive thing is, who was their thesis advisor? It's very hard to tell faculty members not to check for those things. I don't know how we do it. <laughs> don't we always have to submit a two-page CV to all the grant that we apply to and the pedigree in your education has to be there. That means someone's looking at it because it's a required component. It has to be there. It has to be at the top. It's the very first thing you see. It's not even at the bottom. So it does matter. So I am not sure how we can ever separate that from what we do maybe over the years i can see that in a, if you work in an industry 20 years later after you work at a job i don't think people were looking at your where your degrees come from anymore but in academic world that would always matter in my point of view right you look at all the university department websites when you look at each individual faculty where they came from in terms of education, where they where and when they got their degrees, they're all there. So prestige would always stay with you if you come from one of those prestigious colleges or universities. Often I have been mentored to state those credentials as a black female scientist. So on one hand, we're trying to get people to stay away from reviewing those credentials. And then on the other hand, when I walk into a classroom to give a lecture, I'm encouraged to state my credentials. <laughs> so it's like this balancing act of when you say it and when you don't, or when you look at it and when you don't. Exactly, it's a hard balance. Another thing that came out of the publication from this particular nature paper was that they found that in academia, in terms of recruiting faculty or faculty production, overall, 80% of all domestically trained faculty came from 20% of universities. These 20%, the top five universities, are UC Berkeley, Harvard, University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Stanford. I found that really fascinating. I mean, now the data is there. I'm not so surprised about these five universities, but without this data, I would have never thought that 80% of all faculty came from 20 universities. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and I think that's because like this, as you said, I'm not surprised this is schools are on the list, but they are training their students. They have special programs. I've been sitting in some fellowships for PhDs. And when I read those proposals, when I compare it with other schools, it's whole different level. They train people from as soon as they enter the graduate program to become future faculties. And they have these systematic programs in place. Like I do remember one so vividly, and it was early on when we started our podcast. And there was this fellowship, this student who was applying for this fellowship on the first year of the graduate school saying that I have my own podcast talking about diversity in graduate program. And I was like, <laughs> it took us 20 years after our graduate program to think about having a podcast. And then I read more, the resources that the university was providing, it was there. And so I'm not surprised because if the students, they are exposed to that environment, they start thinking about faculty position from day one when they enter to the program. There are things available to train them. Well, obviously they make it to the top candidates when we are doing our faculty searches. There is no way to compete with them unless all universities equally they have access to this type of training or these resources and everybody equally being exposed to these 
opportunities and some universities they are more invested than the, the others and the amount of the resources that these places they have it's not comparable to tier three schools we are contributing to this inequality and we are also part of it too but wouldn't that pose a problem that means this inequality will carry through in terms of academic culture in terms of productivity, in terms of structure. All these people who are trained from, say, these top five institutions that produce all these faculty, then because they're trained in that environment, they go to another university, they carry everything that they learned, everything in terms of their thinking, in terms of the way they think, in terms of the structure of carrying out their research labs, and all of those will be the same as they were trained from. So over the years, wouldn't that just make the entire university, all the universities within the US all look the same? There is no diversity in that sense. But we want someone from a different background not necessarily gender or race, but just culturally, in terms of academic culture, in terms of the habits, the way you do research. We want some diversity in that sense too. Yeah, I agree with that because I was just sitting here thinking about how much of my training at the University of Michigan was because of my advisor versus how I was brought up. So I feel like I went into graduate school with good work ethics. And so my advisor just enhanced that <laughs> by adding more rigor and more things. So I agree that that's where the diversity comes from. It's what if I had a different household and didn't have that rigor and I went to Michigan, would I have still, I still probably would have got elected to go to many schools in terms of starting my tenure track profession, but maybe I would not have had a stronger work ethic. You know what I'm trying to say? And I think that work ethic that I have from my childhood carries over into everything that I do, even in my administrative tasks now, and even in the classroom, and even when I talk to my students, when I'm advising them. So for me, I really do think it's really important. I think having different races, different people coming from different backgrounds in terms of how they live and how they grew up. And also, Lucy, you said that the schools, they will look all the same in 20 years or so. It reminded me of a recently, I have had to <laughs> visit a colleague at University of Michigan that he himself graduated from Caltech. We were talking about another colleague that he's in another institute and I was talking about that I don't know how he can manage this large group of 35 people working under him, just bringing a couple of million dollars to afford <laughs> having this large group is very difficult. And he said, oh, he learned it from his advisor from Caltech. He was a super postdoc when he himself was at Caltech. And I was like, super postdoc? He said, yeah, there are these hierarchical structures. Super postdoc, I don't know, less of a super postdoc. I don't know what was the, the ranking. But we learn from our advisor because we don't know anything better. And when we become faculty, we try to start with something. And that's without us even knowing it's part of our system and we implement that. Like if your advisor had super postdoc, you want to have a super postdoc. If your advisor didn't have a postdoc, you don't have a postdoc. So unfortunately, these things, they won't change unless, as Kim mentioned, intentionally we go and we bring diverse people to add, to break this chain. Otherwise, it keeps going and going and going. And then at the end, we all look the same, but with different names. The next point that the, the author pointed out that they went in a little bit further with the data that they collected on women on the tenure track. We were just talking about inequalities in faculty production, and we had always known that gender inequality had always been the thing. It wasn't necessarily came out of the last 10 years or so, but their data showed 
that in fact, particularly in the STEM field, in the ten years that they were collecting data from, actually had a women representation rose from twelve point five to seventeen point one percent among all faculty. That is a great news because that representation basically significantly increased in academia in STEM fields. The study also showed it wasn't just STEM field alone. Among many other domains and fields, the conclusion though is that even though there is an increase in the women representation in among all faculty, the attrition is also quite high. At the end, the ten-year tracking shows that the overall women representation is still. Remain flat, even though we're making great efforts in new women faculty hires within the ten-year window with the high attrition uh, involved in women. It doesn't really improve very much. That is very interesting. I had always known that we put in a great amount of efforts in recruiting women in our STEM fields, but the at the end it doesn't look like things are improving after all. That means people are leaving. Women are leaving, even though they became faculty at some point in their career. I personally think that because retention is an important thing, it's not just recruiting them and bringing them on board. If there are not enough resources to support them, they end up leaving. But but that was a really good news to hear from the percentage over the past years has been increased from 12% to 17%. So maybe now we need to shift our effort and focus on how we can retain them. So one thing I've noticed that even when we retain them, they end up being stuck in the associate professor rank as well. That's another thing. So we might retain them from assistant to associate, but then they get stuck or burnt out. And I think we talked about that in another podcast, but I just want to bring it up again that that's also a source possibly for them to leave because they feel like they can't move from the associate to the full professorship. Or sometimes they get trapped in an administrative role that, you know, sucks them or takes them away from their research that would help them and a scholarship that would help them be promoted. Another option that I'm also seeing is that a lot of women leave because we're such a minority in the field that we tend to get approached by companies and government agencies to come and work for them or with them or consult. That's probably a more attractive in a sense, maybe financially, maybe the flexibility, maybe the resources and everything. So those are some of the things that I've seen that may stifle women in terms of them remaining in the academy. Actually, that reminds me, Kim, what you were saying. It's not in this paper, but during his talk, he actually had more data to elaborate on this. He did a survey. That is not presented in this paper alone. He did a survey and、uh, surveyed all men and women about what is in terms of work-life balance, in terms of the working environment, how comfortable they are, and how hostile they are. And they surveyed in terms of you know, quality of of work type of questions, and it turns out that women. In general, are very unhappy about the working environment. That is the biggest disparity of data comparing to men. Work-life balance, obviously, that's in terms of stress-inducing item. That is also there, but it's not as high as hostile environment. So I thought that was also interesting. That's very much compatible to what you were talking about. The fact that maybe they were given more service. Tasks. So the next item that the paper talked about is about self-hiring within institutions. So that is actually a very interesting topic. When I was in grad school, I wasn't really looking for a faculty position, but I always I remember hearing everybody was talking about, oh, we don't hire our own graduates. So in other words, if you get your PhD, say from University of Michigan. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't get hired by University of Michigan. I had seen exceptions to that, but the exception I've seen in two ways. One is that you go somewhere else first as a faculty and you kind of prove yourself that you can be independent and then you can get brought back in to your original degree granting institution. And then another exception is when your advisor retires, they need someone who can replace that area that's missing otherwise. So those are the two examples that I have seen. The data from this paper reveals that only about 9.1% of all professors are self-hired back to their original degree granting institution. So I have something to say. Do we have to rehire back the same type of person in that same area? Is it really necessary? So if Professor X and Phil Y retires, do we really have to do a search to replace Professor Y in Professor in, in Research Field X? That always troubles me because I think it's an opportunity for us to think of an upcoming new attractive field and then explore opportunities that students are now engaging in. Like there's so many interdisciplinary areas that we're missing because we're so stuck in this very, you know, rigid subject matter. That's all I wanted to say. I just, as soon as Lucy said something, I was like cringing because I spend more time in search committees arguing about the same research field that Professor X just retired from and trying to convince them, can we think of a fresh topic? There's so many PhD candidates that are coming out of school with all of these interdisciplinary things. And we're trying to say, no, I want them to do exactly this. I'm done. You're so absolutely right. That all contributes to opportunities for diversity, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you don't give that opportunity, it'll never happen. Well, and I know that those schools, their trick is, oh, we hired this person who looks different than the original one. <laughs> and that's diversity. But I agree with you both. And, and I've heard that so many times that never ever think about going back to the schools that you graduated from, unless you are these stars and yeah. And also maybe we should not even think about going back to, a, to the same school because it's kind of strange that you've been a student and you called everybody professor, blah, blah, blah. And now you are colleagues with them and you need to call them with their first name is really weird. So I think that this self hiring, it should just go away. <laughs> it's like, we should not have it at all. I'm sure a lot of search committees, they're like, we only trust our own people. I am sure some would say that as a way to recruit their own former students. I guess I just need to say something in case that some people, they get offended. Yeah, there are some superstars. Maybe they need to go back for whatever reason they have family reasons or it's their hometown or they need to be there. So yeah, there should be some exceptions, but I don't think that we should promote this. I think that it, it doesn't help with the, having a healthy environment in the academy. Overall, this paper basically talked about prestige. And we all know, while we were looking for a faculty position, there's a social hierarchy. It's unspoken. You see all the ads, they say, we are open and we don't discriminate against whatever. But as a matter of fact, from this study, it says 100% of faculty would hold positions of equal or lower prestige than their doctoral training. So 100%. In other words, if you graduated, you got your degree from a second tier institution, your first job, at least your first one, maybe you can move as you go, move forward, but your first faculty position, you will not be getting a tier one position. That's a tough one because 
honestly, that was one of the main reasons I chose to go to University of Michigan. It was because I knew that when I got out, no one would question my degree. And I had to think about it from a perspective of I'm a black female physicist. If I got my degree at a school that my peers didn't think was rigid enough or structured enough or demanding enough, they would minimize how hard I had to work to earn this degree. And so it was one of the main reasons why I went to the University of Michigan and I don't regret it. I don't. And I think it was the right choice. And I think it was the right program. And it turned out to be a good fit for me. But I have seen other colleagues, other minority uh, faculty members that was in my cohort that didn't go to Michigan, that went to other schools, that they were not as successful because you need the right environment. And so sometimes picking the more well-named school may not be a good fit for the person emotionally, physically, like the whole process because grad school is hard. So does that mean people have to like, if, if someone ever wants to become a faculty, they have to think so far ahead of time for that to happen because one thing leads to another. So if you don't choose wisely or it wasn't the right fit or whatever it is, say you came out of a tier two institution, that's it. Then that means you can never become a faculty like what you wanted to. So it's interesting. I think about this all the time when I train my graduate students or recruit them to come to Howard to work with me. I have to think it's not a Michigan, it's not a Harvard, it's not a Yale. I have to work now 100 times harder to train this student because people are gonna think, oh, they're coming out of Howard. It's not as rigorous, it's not as this. And then I remember without saying names, one of my colleagues said, oh, well, if your student comes out of your group with a PhD working with you, it's sort of like we're looking at the fact that your pedigree came from Michigan. So even then, they're still looping it back to my training. They're not looping it to Howard, that they're getting a PhD at Howard. They're looping it to the fact that the advisor of the student that graduated from Howard went to Michigan to get the PhD. And I'm like, I don't know how to feel about that. I, I don't, I don't. So I just wanted to share that with you that it never ends. It's really difficult to change people's way of thinking. Even though Howard is the number one producer of undergraduate students that go on to get PhDs, they still have things in their mind. I was gonna say that I did not know anything about the whole prestige in academia and I chose to go to grad school totally based on the climate and environment even in my in interview for the fellowship I told the very famous guy that he, there is a theory named after him he asked me why I chose that school I said oh because of the climate and they looked at each other and they were like oh and we have a good mechanics program too <laughs> so anyhow but i did not realize that till when i got my postdoc uh, or i was doing my postdoc and i was part of this hiring process the first time i was exposed to those i realized that i was fortunate enough that i got that postdoc position because i was part of the in the category of those, I don't know, prestigious schools or whatever they call it. And to this day, I wish that I had applied for other schools. Not that that school wasn't a good school. The, the author is coming from that school. <laughs> so it must be a good school. But, you know, it's like if you are coming from Stanford, Caltech, University of Michigan, all those other schools, people, they look at you differently. People, they think you bring different ideas to the table. And unfortunately, I don't think that these things are going away. And I feel that I'm guilty too. I tell my postdocs and my graduate students don't look up don't apply for MIT don't apply for you know for the for the faculty position at MIT or Harvard because I know they have no chance why they should waste their time but maybe we should change the way that we are training 
our students and make them brave enough to apply for those schools because the more that they apply will change this culture they will see these more applicants and oh this candidate is good even though they are coming from a university that is lower than us but i think that at some point this culture and this hierarchy and the the, the prestige that it goes with this school we can make all the schools to be prestigious not just only five school that everybody recruits from. It's very well said. Or the author said there, he doesn't know why certain things happen because this is purely data analysis. But I think just our own, as a responsible faculty member, as a, a responsible mentor to our future students, all of that needs to be thought through over time so that how this uh, structure and how this hierarchy and the prestige are all established can be someday broken so everybody would have equal chance without looking at the history of their academic training we first wanted to thank the author for giving us this uh, content to discuss and it's a very interesting set of data and obviously there are way more that i'm sure the others can dig into as well as the rest of us who are interested in digging into the data so hopefully we can keep this conversation going and and things will change for the better thank you so much for listening we hope you enjoyed this conversation you can follow us on Facebook and listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life.